We've already looked at the characteristics of mountain bolts in two units. In the unit on deformation, we began to look at the way in which rocks deform during the mountain building process. In the unit on plate tectonics, we talked in generalities about the fact that mountain bolts occur at the boundaries of lithospheric plates. In this program, we'll take mountain bolts a little farther and look at the detail of the way in which they're produced at the boundaries of plates. There are several kinds of mountain bolts. There are those produced by the collision of plates, for example, the Himalayas. There are those that are produced above subduction zones, for example, the Andes, and there are other types as well. We'll look at these different types and we'll take as our examples to Canadian mountain bolts, the Rockies and the Northern Appalachians as they occur in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland. But before we get to the main part then of our discussion of mountain bolts, let's remind ourselves of some other kinds of mountains that we've seen. Uh, volcanoes, for example, the Hawaiian Islands form mountain bolts. That's a string of islands on the ocean floor forming the Hawaiian chain. They're very, very high mountains, just the tip of them appearing above the sea level. But they're not a very important kind of mountain. We don't see much of them. Most of them are the kinds of forms and the kinds of faults it produced. But the main mountain ranges, the most important ones, are those which form great linear belts across the face of the Earth. The Himalayas, for example, the Rocky Mountains, the Ural Mountains, the Andes Mountains, and so forth. And it's these on which we'll concentrate our attention. Just to remind you of some of the features of a mountain belt that you have already looked at, let's look back again at the Rocky Mountains and look in particular this time not just at the way that the rocks are deformed, but what kind of rocks they are. Because if we're going to interpret mountain belts, then we must start by understanding the conditions under which those rocks were deposited. The front of the Rocky Mountains, towering over the plains and rounded foothills to the west of Calgary, looks like a colossal limestone wall. In fact, it's built of overlapping slices of rock heaved into place from miles to the west along thrust faults, such as this one beneath Mount Yamnuska. The fault follows the slope of the vegetation beneath the steep limestone cliff. Fossil-rich reef limestone is the rock of many of the giant thrust slices. Some exposures, once rich in fossils, are now barren, their fossils having been dissolved by water seeping through the rock. Millions of the tiny cavities left form the reservoir for the great oil fields of Western Canada. Many fossils are still, however, intact, bearing witness to the warmth and richness of the seas in which the limestone was deposited. Mount Eisenhower is a sentinel of fossiliferous limestone, an eroded remnant of a once continuous sheet, now broken itself by a diagonal thrust fault, dividing it into a higher and a lower slice. Mount Balfour is another piece of thrust limestone. The upturned edges of some of the thrust slices form distinctive blocky limestone ranges. The upturned edges of more shaly strata produce mountains of a slightly different character, somewhat more rounded, but still very rugged. Folding, as well as thrust faulting, is often beautifully visible in some of the vertical faces. These strata have reacted somewhat plastically to the deforming mountain building forces. Folds in the limestone also occur on a somewhat smaller scale. In sandstones in some of the thrust slices, cross bedding gives an indication of the direction in which the sand was brought, the cross bedding indicating the current direction. Within the mountain belt, there's a quite sudden change in rock type from limestone to shale. This is an important change for interpreting the origin of mountain belts, and also an important transition for mining geologists. Since deposits of lead and zinc, such as reached by the small adits in this cliff, commonly occur at this junction. In fact, the deposits are in reefs, limestone nodules, or limestone beds, 
in the shale. Shaley strata react in a distinctive fashion to the compressive mountain building forces. In this case, sharp kink folds are formed, a type of deformation of rather brittle character. Passing to the west, beyond the shale, the last rock type differs markedly from the earlier rocks. These are volcanic rocks in the westerly Selkirk ranges of the Rockies. Any mountain range, and, and that includes the Rockies, can seem very confusing at first sight, just a jumble of rocks faulted and folded. But if we build a model, then it's quite easy to identify the various elements of the mountain range. Beginning in the east are the strata which are formed from the erosion of the mountain range, sands and muds brought by rivers from the mountain range and deposited, for example, in the flatland around Calgary. And then into the mountain range proper, the various thrust slices in the Rockies, mostly Cambrian and Ordovician limestones, sometimes folded. or sheets. And here, the very important facies change, or change in rock type, from limestone to shale, the somewhat darker color on the model. That's a change that we'll look at in a moment. And then, in the very west, volcanics. In fact, in the Rockies, there are much more in the way of volcanics than we've represented on this model. And within the volcanics, intrusions of granitic-like rocks that we didn't see in the film, but are nevertheless quite important in the westerly ranges of the Rockies. Now, if we're to disentangle the importance of those different rock types, then we must disentangle the mountain belt itself. And to do that, what we have to do is to unthrust the thrust sheets, lay them out as they originally would have been, and we must unfold the folds, straighten out the strata as they would have been. And in this fashion, we can build ourselves up a picture of what the mountain range was like, how the rocks were disposed, before the compression built the mountain range, before the rocks were thrust, and before they were folded. And if we do that, we find that we get three belts of rocks in the Rocky Mountains, and also in most other mountain ranges. In the Rockies, we have a broad belt of limestone with occasional sandstones with cross bedding in them, indicating that the sand has been brought from the interior of the continent. So we can envisage there being a broad, warm, shallow sea with rivers flowing into it, bringing some sand. That kind of situation is what we find on the continental shelf by Florida. And then farther out, under what conditions do you think shale would be deposited? Well, shale at the edge of continental shelves sinks out of suspension and forms thick, muddy layers. That's the kind of situation in which apparently the rocks of the Rocky Mountains and also of other mountain ranges, such as the Appalachians, were deposited. Let's look at that situation on the continental margin of the eastern United States. Here is the coastline 